So, ladies and gentlemen, let's continue our journey. And uh, let's go back to this view graph. I promised that I wouldn't torture you very much with mathematics, but dynamics without elementary mechanics, I wouldn't call, call it mathematics, uh, doesn't exist. And moreover, then, uh, that my talk is about modeling, analytical modeling. So, going back to this view graph, what you see uh, on the top is an equation of motion of an elongated printed circuit board and two uh, terms are considered here. The first one is the elastic uh, strain uh, term that uh, it's a loading uh, per unit length uh, that is equivalent to the uh, strain elastic uh, behavior of the of the um, printing circuit, circuit board. And the second term has to do directly with vibrations. As a matter of fact, if we wouldn't have vibrations, but would have instead a, um, a distributed load, in this case, instead of having zero on the right-hand side, we would have this uh, distributed load. And instead of uh, having this uh, and this inertia term wouldn't exist. On the other hand, in this case, uh, the, uh, the uh, distributed load is nothing else but this in these inertia forces. So um, if we will put this uh, second term here to the right, we can consider that it was a, a plate, a printed circuit board that has a certain elasticity, which is described by the term d times w to the fourth as a x and t, and is loaded by inertia forces. Inertia forces, as we know, it should be with a minus. The, in this case, it's uh, the distributed load is due to inertia forces, which is will be minus m times to the, uh, the second derivative, which is acceleration. And we know that in accordance with the D'Alembert principle in mechanics. Now, if we seek the solution in the form of the equation W is a function, we separate the two variables at time in the coordinate. And for the coordinate, we know whatever happens, uh, the deflections should be distributed in accordance with the cosine function. And whatever happens, it's the maximum displacement should be in the middle. And the, uh, and the displacement at the, at the support should be zero. And this, uh, in this function, uh, principal coordinate uh, plays a role of the amplitude. If it's a maximum, it's the amplitude of vibrations. If it's not maximum, it's a function of time. It's the instantaneous amplitude at the given moment of time. So the physics of this um, uh, sort solution is very transparent. So when we introduce this solution into basic equation, we obtain first the, the equation that you see uh, on the left hand side on the top, uh, which is uh, d, flexural rigidity of the board, times pi divided to a to the uh, exponent of 4, times this principal coordinate, and times uh, this uh, distributed load, and then equal to 0 because the cosine uh, goes away, is cancelled. Uh, so then the next step, we bring this uh, equation to the form of a, uh, um, of a uh, equation of a free vibrations of a uh, uh, system with a um, single degree of freedom. Uh, and the notation which is used here is very important, which is pi squared divided by 4a square root of flexural rigidity divided by ma squared. And this is the formula. Uh, for the what just came out of this equation, uh, the formula for the natural frequency. But if you want to interpret in, interpret this formula for the natural frequency as uh, the same way as what we did for the single degree of freedom system when we had just a load hanging on a spring, in this case we will use a k divided by m, and, uh, and the uh, additional uh, notations that we introduce is k is, uh, of course, uh, the spring constant goes up if the flexural rigidity goes up, and it's uh, inversely proportional to the, uh, to the length of the 
uh, of the PCB squared. But the important and non-obvious thing is the mass that has come out automatically from this solution is not exactly the mass of the system. It's a so-called generalized mass, and it's only a quarter. In this case, it's only a quarter of the uh, mass of the system and the physics of that. The physical explanation is that because uh, it's not the entire printed circuit board that experiences the same uh, the same uh, uh, loading, but the loading and the performance, the behavior of a particular cross section depends on where it's located with respect to the uh, mid cross section, and that's reflected in the formula for the uh, generalized mass. Now, uh, in the previous <coughs> analysis, we deliberately restricted that analysis to the first modes of vibration only. And in the theory of dynamics, of dynamic response of printed circuit board, of other elements, the natural question is, and what is the role of the upper, of the higher modes? Because the more quote unquote dynamic is the loading, the more it's closer to the instantaneous impulse, the more uh, modes of vibration this loading generates. And how important are they, and how, whether, uh, to what extent we should be concerned about their role? And let's now use the same equation, but uh, will be seeking its solution not in the form of a just uh, principal coordinate of the first mode times the cosine, but we will um, uh, seek um, this uh, uh, solution in the form of a series uh, where the I represents a certain modes of vibration because here, and we discussed it yesterday, uh, only the odd modes were will be generated, we have i is changing from 1, 3, 5, and so on to n, whatever n is, infinity. And uh, accordingly, uh, the principal coordinates will be different for different modes. And the uh, functions, these will be also different. It will be more than just one half wave of a deflection. It will be uh, three half waves, uh, five, and so on. Um, along the, uh, the printed circuit board. Now, we'll do the same procedure, follow the same procedure what we did before. We will introduce the sort solution into the equation. Uh, then we'll see that uh, it will, uh, the, the result will be indeed equal to zero if the expression in the uh, brackets will be equal to zero for any x and that gives us a very nice uh, result that although we considered all these uh, modes together, but we can get away without uh, considering each mode, each i, uh, separately. So because it's a linear approach, then we can consider each mode separately and to use an expression the same that we used in the previous treatment. Mm, let me go back. In this case, the only difference is that in this equation, where f with the two dots plus omega squared f, uh, a function of t, if the f's were, will have a uh, uh, index, a subscript of i. Other than that, it will be the same equation, and uh, certainly the solution will be similar, and the results uh, will be similar. The, again, the only difference is the natural frequencies will uh, increase uh, with the number of the mode of vibration squared. So that means that the frequency of the third mode of vibration will be nine, time, uh, higher, nine times higher than the first mode, the fifth mode of vibration will be um, 25 times higher and so on. Um, and uh, uh, for this type of, uh, of a support, it turns out that the mass will be the same, generalized mass will be the same for uh, different modes, but the spring constant will be different. And actually, that's the equation that I just uh, mentioned to you, which is similar to the equation in the uh, previous slide, is written here at the end. It's the last equation, which has a very simple solution, depending on the 
on the initial conditions. Now, let's uh, consider these particular initial conditions. What we will have, uh, how we should revisit this equation depending on the uh, initial conditions during the drop height. Again, we repeat exactly the same, we have the same equation, then we seek the solution exactly in the same way, and then we um, uh, obtain the same solution, uh, the same equations for the principal coordinate as in the previous situation, and even for the, for this, uh, uh, for the system with a single degree of freedom, the only the uh, subscript, uh, the index here is i. Uh, but uh, we seek the solution to this equation, as you see in the form of a sinusoid. We don't know yet what uh, the uh, amplitudes will be c sub i, but we know that whatever they will be, uh, it should be the frequency of the solution should be omega sub i, and we substitute this i, uh, this uh, solution f sub i uh, is equal to c sub i sine w sub i t. Uh, so when uh, we introduce that into the um, into the, uh, the uh, or maybe we'll do it first this way. Uh, first, we'll take the second equation and we will differentiate it with respect to uh, to time, and then we'll obtain obtain the equation which is uh, here located immediately after the uh, under the uh, the sketch for the printed circuit board, and this is the equation for the uh, for the uh, velocity. Important thing that at the initial point of time when uh, we, uh, it's dropped and it's only the printed circuit board touches the, the, fl the floor, all the points of this printed circuit board, regardless of where they're located at the initial mo moment of time, have exactly the same velocity. And this velocity can be calculated as a square root of 2gh, it's clear. So uh, the following, when you follow these derivations, it's uh, pretty simple. Um, we found that the initial condition for the, we find the additional condition for the principal coordinate for its, its velocity is um, by the, given by the lowest formula on the uh, upper, on the right hand side. And it is not just the square root of 2gh, but it has also 4 divided by ip. And this 4 divided by ip has again to do with that situation that it's true. The initial velocity was the same for all of them, but when it's after the response will be different for different points. And therefore, this uh, factor 4 divided by ip takes care of that. But on the other hand, if we will take this uh, principal coordinate and we'll seek its solution in the form of, uh, of uh, c uh, sub i times sine omega sub i t, as you see on the right hand side, third formula from, from above, or the third formula from below. And in this case, if uh, you will uh, 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 you will differentiate that in order to find the velocity. You will have s sub i times omega sub cos uh, times cosine. At the initial moment of time, cosine w t when t is zero, it's one. So that's how we come up with the formula where uh, the, this is the lowest formula on the right hand side, 4 divided by ip, square root of 2gh is equal c sub i uh, times omega i. From here we find this c sub i, and from here we find everything. So we solve this problem, and you see it's not that complicated. And uh, we found that the principal coordinate is, uh, is uh, uh, expressed by the lowest equation in, on this view graph, and it's a total displacement with consideration of the higher modes of vibration. Actually, it's not displacement, it's a displacement for the principal coordinate, if you want to, to find. Oh, no, that's uh, right. Uh, so it's, 
Yes, because uh, it's for the principle, for its total displacement. So by the way, it's a typo here. It should be f as a function of t. It should be w as a function of x t, because here you have also x's and you have uh, mm -hmm. so the general solution. So the very the lowest formula has a typo, and it shouldn't be f as a function of t. It should be w as a function of x and t. But the important thing uh, in this formula that, as you see, uh, these uh, these series converge very rapidly because it has i cube in the denominator. That means roughly each t next term, in the maximum value is not roughly; it's exactly of each next term. It's for the first one is one. For the second one is 1 divided by 27, 3 in the cube. For the next one is 1 divided by 125. So two or three, maximum four terms give a accurate enough solution. So we've solved the problem. Now let's see what we'll do with this problem. You know, as I say in, uh, in this type of analysis, before you start solving a problem, think what you'll do with its solution. And here, what, what we'll do with the solution. So this is the equation uh, that we have. And uh, elastic body, high modes of vibration, energy balance. Now I want to calculate the energy. And I have the, how I calculate the energy is that I'll take the displacement, uh, to differentiate that with respect uh, to the time that gives me velocity and energy, kinetic energy. By the way, it's uh, K in the lowest formula. It's not the spring constant. Uh, it's just I use the same. I should I shouldn't have done that, but uh, in this case, it's kinetic energy uh, of the of the beam of the plate, elongated uh, uh, plate. And look at the lowest formula, and let's discuss it a little bit because there is a lot of interest and important physics there. Of course, first the kinetic energy, and the kinetic energy at the initial moment of time uh, should be the same as the initial potential energy, and should be the same as the potential energy, the strain energy after the uh, the printed circuit board uh, deflects to its full extent. And now let's take a look. We have uh, Drew, that's a formal uh, and simple mathematics. If you'll go through that, and uh, the second term, first to just we substitute everything, the second term, we have a uh, factor 16 divided pi squared. Then we have MAGH. So, um, so MAGH, it's uh, proportional to the, its initial kinetic energy of the first mode of vibrations. Um, and uh, then a 16 divided pi squared and this uh, summation of 1 divided by i squared. That's a correction that takes care of the higher modes of vibration. So if you will go to the next uh, formula, uh, you will see that the kinetic energy uh, of the entire printed circuit board can be calculated as pi the, uh, squared uh, divided by 8 and times the kinetic energy uh, that is due to the first mode only. And so pi the, uh, squared divided by 8 is 1.2337. And indeed, if uh, you will uh, calculate the initial potential energy of the board, you will have 2 MAGH as it's supposed to be. But the important thing here is that uh, if you want to determine the uh, total energy, the strain energy of the entire board, you should multiply the kinetic uh, energy or uh, for the, of the first board uh, by a factor of 1.23. It's true, indeed, the total energy is greater, as it should be, than the energy of the first mode only, but it's greater if, or if you take all the higher modes together, it's only greater by, by a factor of 1.23, 23%. 23%. Uh, 
Uh, well, in this case, we can do that. Uh, we will be conservative if we'll do the following. If we will calculate the total energy and we'll attribute that to the first mode only, in this case, we will uh, overestimate the actual response, the actual stresses, actual everything by, by 23%, which is probably fine. So that's a useful thing to know. Uh, just uh, speaking in advance of what will happen with nonlinear modes of vibration, I would say it's even more justified to restrict the analysis to the first mode of vibrations. It's even more justified uh, to, uh, to do that for the nonlinear vibrations uh, because uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, tensile forces, uh, membrane forces, uh, have a significant effect on the first mode, but have a very, very low effect on the higher modes. And therefore, if we consider the first mode and we consider the, the uh, energy which is due to the uh, stretching of the uh, printed circuit board, we will be, as engineers, in a reasonably good shape. We will consider everything. So in other words, we'll be conservative, but not very much conservative. Next um, problem is uh, uh, when the impact load is applied to one of the ends of a thin and elongating portable device. We already sort of uh, discussed this problem that has to do with the portable device when it's dropped and it hits the floor with just one end. And uh, here are the results. I will not go into the detailed description. I'll give you the results. For a constant suddenly applied and suddenly removed load, the dynamic factor for the time um, after the uh, load is removed, and the T sub zero is the duration of the short term load, so it's the largest of the less moment of time, so that's the moments where the load is removed, and takes place when the duration of the loading is equal to half the period of vibrations, um, and is equal in this case to dynamic factor is equal to two. Again, this magic number two, which is not a surprise. However, this uh, dynamic factor is different uh, and, and is a little bit smaller if a, uh, the impact load has a sign shape, which is actually prescribed by the JEDEC uh, standard. And the dynamic factor uh, for, for, uh, for this time is the largest uh, at the moment, uh, also the same moment when the, uh, when the uh, load is removed uh, at the time of loading, which is equal to half the period of vibrations, but it's equal only to pi divided by two. So it's a little bit higher than 1.5. Uh, again, so dynamic factor is a dynamic factor, so we want to consider that. But at the same time, there's a static factor. And again, that goes back to that physics that I described uh, a couple of hours ago, some time ago, that has to do with uh, if uh, the load is close to the instantaneous impulse, and instead of considering, as we should, the, uh, the uh, impulse, Instead, if we will consider the maximum value of this load that acts statically at the system, that I call it a static factor. In other words, the dynamic factor, dynamics is favorable, statics is not, and the statics in this case is a uh, quote unquote paper tiger uh, because in reality, uh, we will think that the system actually reacted to this force, but in effect it didn't, it didn't have time. And these you can see that this static factor uh, can be uh, pretty high and uh, for example, uh, for a load of the duration which is one eighth of the period of vibration that can be, according to our analysis, harmlessly substituted with instantaneous impulse. Uh, if we will consider the static factor, it will be as high as four. 
And in the case of sun-shaped force, it will be 1.27. Uh, so this is a static factor, but the difference is the dynamic factor is a real thing. It should be considered. A static factor is a paper tiger. It shouldn't be considered. It's only if we will try to substitute the, the reaction to a short-term dynamic loading, assuming that the system will be able to react uh, to the uh, total uh, level of the maximum level of the, level of the force. Uh, here is, uh, I'm describing how the strain energy changes in this situation when uh, we consider, consider rotation. And in this case, without going into the details, I calculated the strain energy of the sprinted circuit board of the entire, maybe, a thin and elongated device, and how the strain energy should be reduced if you'll consider the fact that the device can rotate and there are certain the part of energy should be also subtracted from the potential energy uh, due to the fact that it bounces back, but it's not only bounces back, it bounces back and at the same time it rotates. Therefore, we should uh, subtract from the initial energy not only the bounce heights, height, but also the fact that the device uh, uh, reached this height uh, experiencing rotation. And uh, this is considered in this analysis. I didn't go into the, uh, all the uh, mechanical uh, quantitative details, but just want to emphasize the physics of it, which is certainly important. And uh, uh, here I will simply, uh, that's a continuation of, the, of this analysis of strain energy. So if the device mass were uniformly distributed over length, then the radius of inertia would be a divided by square root of three. And uh, uh, so uh, again, what this says that we should, uh, we can inter interpret uh, the bounce height of the device, bouncing height of the device, uh, if uh, we will want to include into the actual uh, bouncing height, also the role of rotation. This bouncing height should be multiplied. What we see as a result of an experiment, we should multiply it by a factor of 1.75 uh, if we want to consider uh, the rotation. In this case, uh, the difference would, between the initial height and the actual realistic effective bouncing height will be smaller because the actual bouncing height will multiply by a factor of 175. And because this difference will be smaller, if you will consider the fact that the uh, device rotates, the uh, inside of the device, it's a favor for the printed circuit board inside, and the energy accumulated by the printed circuit board uh, will be a lot smaller. Uh, I'll simply will not go into the details. It probably will be too cumbersome. But uh, there is a way, in a simple way, an uh, elegant way, uh, to calculate the deflections, uh, the curvatures. Uh, the curvatures can be, of course, used as a, uh, as a criteria and as a measure of the, of the uh, strain, accumulated strain energy. Uh, there are some interesting mathematical, mechanical um, complications here because the series for the cur for the displacement they uh, they converge very rapidly uh, by the series for the curvature uh, diverge but nonetheless could be used for the uh, reasonably acceptable practical assessment I'll not go into the details uh, I will go now of the some results of the accelerated drop testing of the board level and predicted dynamic response of elongated printed circuit board to include apply to one, one of its ends. And uh, I'll simply show you the general formulas. I will not go very much into the details. There are some interesting physics involved, but not to an extent that I want to spend 
my time and your time and understanding the physics. I also want to tell you that there is analytical solutions. It turned out to be an excellent agreement with uh, finite element analysis, but we are still in the process of understanding how these results could be applied, should be applied uh, to the design and evaluation of the reliability of uh, printed circuit boards and after that in SATA joints in uh, portable devices. Uh, I will skip uh, these view graphs, although they show you uh, that actually the actual numbers. Uh, or maybe I'll say a couple of words about that. It was an allegated printed circuit board and, um, that with the following input data. And it was actually the real printed circuit board that was used in a, in a portable device. Its uh, thickness was one millimeter. The half length was 50 millimeters, so the entire length. It's in a portable device of, uh, in an experimental setup. And uh, here you see the uh, Young's modulus, uh, distributed mass, uh, the flexural rigidity D, the calculated uh, frequency, and the calculated effective mass. So all these things that I described uh, here in numerical example uh, were calculated. You'll have these view graphs. Uh, you will have a chance to look through them. And if you have questions, get back to me. But I don't want to spend more time on these examples. And here you can simply, I want simply to say that you can uh, because the series for the maximum deflections, they converge very well. Uh, you can use as a criterion of the, uh, of the uh, bending of the printed circuit board as a result of testing. You can use the difference between the uh, deflection, calculate deflection of the mid cross section and at the ends because the printed the device here was considered was actually support free and therefore the maximum deflection should be evaluated as a difference between the deflection in the middle and the deflections at the ends. Uh, now I will say I uh, mentioned to you uh, that we also ran uh, tests um, in uh, Intel uh, for the printed circuit board with a concentrated lump mass in the center. I will simply show you the first the motivation was clear. We descri described that. The motivation had to do with the fact that we wanted to enhance the testing conditions. And uh, the background motivation incentive can be formulated this way that structures of the type in question are currently employed in some advanced test vehicles to enhance the dynamic response of the board level, board grid array structure to a drop or a shock impact applied to the printed circuit board support contour. The obtained improved solution for the fundamental frequency and the expression for the deflected service coordinate function could be used also when there is a need to predict the dynamic response characteristics that require differentiation of the coordinate function, for instance, angles of rotations or curvature. As you remember, what I showed here is that uh, you see the curvature can be obtained or should be obtained by differentiation twice with respect to the coordinate, the deflection function. So that's what was the motivation for this analysis. And uh, the objective results were the following. We evaluated the fundamental frequency of linear vibration of simply supported square printed circuit board that was used in the actual testing Intel experimental setup, carrying a concentrated lump mass at its center. The analysis was based on the improved evaluation of the coordinate function. And I will not go into the details. It's a uh, uh, pretty sophisticated, high level mathematical, um, mechanical analysis. 
If some of you are interested, get back to me, but for you the results is important. And I'm saying the obtained impro improved solution to the deflected surface coordinate function could be used also when there is a need to predict the dynamic response characteristics that require differentiation of the coordinate fu function, that's the uh, angle of rotations and curvatures. And here are the results, um, a very straightforward, simple solution. So what you do uh, practically, you calculate the phi number, which is the ratio of the, of the weight of the printed circuit board to G, which is the weight of the lump sum. And then when you have this phi, you go to the table uh, that we calculated, you, you evaluate the number S, which correspond to this ratio, and by having this number s, you use the less formula in, uh, uh, on the left here. And then when you know s value, the only unknown here is the frequency, omega. So from here, you calculate the, this frequency, omega. And so you know that, and then you can certainly compare it with the uh, uh, situation when you don't have a uh, uh, a lump uh, mass. Uh, so let's, for instance, half of the PCB size will be 150 millimeters. So it's huge, and it's actually the test vehicle that was used in Intel. It was not for print, for um, for portable electronics. It was for regular electronics. And PCB general rigidity, uh, uh, flexural rigidity was that was calculated. The distributed mass per unit printed circuit board area was this one, and it's a realistic uh, actual number. Uh, and uh, actually, it was even measured. It was me actual mass was measured and divided by four. If you remember, that's the difference between the generalized ma mass and and uh, uh, the actual mass. And the weight of the concentrated mass of PCB, so that one, so we calculated that. And based on that, we obtained the, the, uh, the uh, frequency of the printed circuit board with the lump mass in the center. And the finite element prediction was practically the same as we obtained, analyti obtained analytically. But analytical prediction, again, they shows, let me show here, clearly indicate what effects, if we are interested in the, in the uh, uh, frequency of the free vibrations in the last formula here. Uh, so you see, we solve this formula for this frequency. You think, cl see clearly what effects this uh, 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 this uh, frequency, the mass, the flexural rigidity, and S considers the role of the uh, of the concentrated mass. Uh, in the absence of the concentrated load, when G was equal to zero, you have just the plate, and the formula, of course, six tells you that phi should be equal to infinity. S, that means that based on this table, as you see, when S is equal to infinity, uh, here the uh, S is equal to 2 as the last line in the table. So in this case, if you use that, uh, and the frequency, frequency will be significantly higher. Uh, on the other hand, if the, uh, and uh, all these numbers are in excellent agreement with finite element predictions. On the other hand, if the concentrated load is infinitely large, then the S is equal to zero, and the induced frequency is also zero. So in other words, if you have a, 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 lamp, a lump mass in the middle, and this mass is huge, no vibration could possibly occur and physically understand that it should be indeed the case. And of course, the model predicts that. Of course, if the model contradicts the common sense, it's probably common sense is correct. We are not Einstein's. In Einstein's prediction, we're in contradiction with the general sense, but not with the common sense. And we're confirmed experimentally, as we know. Uh, but in here, the beauty of analytical and other predictions, of course, we always should be able to check the sanity, sanity of the obtained results. So the situation, so that's why I'm saying here, 
no uh, vibration of the PCB center can possibly occur if the concentrated mass is very large compared to the mass of the PCB itself. This situation is equivalent to the situation where the PCB center point is firmly anchored and cannot exhibit, therefore, any lateral displacement. So if you want to enhance uh, what's going on, please do it, but don't over-enhance it. In other words, the concentrated mass in the middle cannot be very high, otherwise you'll, it will be a different animal and the result will be absolutely misleading. And you will not have any vibrations at all. Uh, uh, the third example, which is also an excellent agreement with finite element, is this. We took this concentrated mass and we sort of spread it out around the printed circuit board. So we obtain a sort of a heavy printed circuit board, but with the uniformly distributed mass, uh, hypothetical. Um, and also we obtained the result and went in the right direction because if you have a more heavy uh, board, the natural frequency should go down. Um, and also the good thing that uh, the concept that uh, I described prior to that, which was based on a different approach, approach based on the, uh, on the uh, principal coordinate, we obtain exactly the same result, also both analytical, using a different analytical approach, which is always nice. Now about nonlinear response. Nonlinear response is much more sophisticated, much more uh, difficult, and unfortunately much more important in a situation when you want to evaluate the mechanical behavior, mechanical response of a printed, printed circuit board or the solder joints or the, the um, surface mounted device on the board level. And in this case, when we do that, when the board is subjected to drop loading or to intensive uh, vibrations, in this case, uh, there is a uh, uh, we come up with significant, whether we want it or not, significant in-plane stresses, and uh, uh, we should consider the nonlinearity that I'm going to discuss. Now, I have here a quote from uh, Leah Tolstoy in Anna Karenina, the, one of the first lines is that all the happy families are alike. I think it's even a uh, uh, a epigraph to the uh, to this famous novel. All the happy families are alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. So what uh, Tolstoy meant is clear. But what I mean by bringing this uh, quote is a linear solution is straightforward, well established. Uh, of course, you can make a mistake there, but you better not to. You can check it. And uh, it's only one linear solution. You cannot have several linear solutions. With nonlinear response, it's more complicated. So these unhappy families are all different. I uh, remember that I read one book about, uh, about nonlinear vibrations many years ago. And the author <laughs> put it this way, uh, the way that we divide the linear, uh, the vibrations on two groups, linear and nonlinear, is that as if we will divide all the subjects in the world into bananas and non-bananas. We more or less know what bananas are, although there are also different bananas, but then the uh, rest of the world are non-bananas. And nonlinear is could be in many ways very different. I will only address one way of nonlinearity, where the nonlinear response of a printed circuit board, and although I mentioned to you several times so far that the, then when the response, when the deflections, when the loading is significant, in addition to bending, uh, we also uh, uh, 
whether we want it or not, we bring in, we invite uh, 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 in-plane stresses. Uh, people call that sometimes membrane stresses. Why? Because a very, very thin plate and very flexible plate, which is called a membrane, uh, does not res resist to bending because its flexural rigidity is next to zero. And the only type of loading that arises in these structural elements when they are subjected to bending are in-plane stresses. And uh, you can simply imagine it's something like a very flexible uh, uh, rubber uh, strip or something like that, uh, a uh, stocking uh, that uh, resists to stretching and practically doesn't resist a thread and doesn't resist to bending. But in actual printed circuit boards, we have both. Although they're thin, and the large deflections of thin plates results in, uh, in uh, uh, in-plane membrane stresses, but it also is associated with bending. Depending on the situation, the, uh, the uh, ratio of the bending stresses to the tensile stresses due to membrane forces can be different. Uh, for instance, you saw already uh, one result when we considered a nonlinear problem indirectly. How we did that? Uh, that was when we discussed uh, the compliant attachment and when we had a circuit mounted device uh, uh, attached by using compliant attachment to a printed circuit board. Uh, we, of course, we solved first the very linear problems, not for the vibrations, but simply we assumed that we already know the forces, we know the bending moments uh, from uh, either from measurement as what we did. I mentioned to you that the measured results were in good agreement with the predictions, but predictions certainly were based on nonlinear analysis because from a linear analysis, you cannot predict the reactive forces. Uh, I want to emphasize in this connection that if these forces were external forces, a different ballgame, if these forces wouldn't be reactive forces but would be applied, applied external forces, the problem wouldn't be uh, nonlinear. It would be linear. It will be a little bit more complicated because we also will have also a term uh, that will be proportional to the, <coughs> this applied external force. But this applied external force, the force itself, would be known. And uh, the force would be known and independent of the uh, uh, rate of the deflection, of the uh, magnitude of the deflection. In the nonlinear, this force is, not, is unknown in advance because it's the f this force varies with time. And although this force, this tensile force, is the same along the printed circuit board for the given moment of time, but it's not the same for different moments of time. It's zero when the printed circuit board is in the equilibrium condition at the moment